May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please take a seat. So, a number of years ago, I had just finished high school and I was doing a year of studying engineering in South Africa. Uh, and at the university where I was, they stored the little engineers in uh, a closet, a, a, a lecture theatre. Um, <laughs> it was pretty close, actually. And um, it was really nice, because usually at, the, at, at university, you move to your lecturer, but the lecturers came to us. I think they thought we were going to get lost or something. Uh, and so we were sort of, we were stored in this lecture theatre most of the time. But every now and then, we would have a spare. And we would emerge, sort of blinking and dazed into the sunlight and stagger around and all collapse on the grass. And we'd make jokes like we know more about the theory of sunlight than the actual practical experience of it. <laughs> we thought it was hilarious. Um, some of us were able to somehow still maintain normal social human interactions, like friendships. Uh, and one of us was friends with a girl who was doing fine arts. So that's not just an arts degree, an arts degree that involves understanding painting and things like that. And this girl would come over and she would try and um, talk to us. <laughs> she was very courageous. Anyway, one day, one day, she had her uh, portfolio with her, like the, the sketchbook that they use in class. And she was talking about drawing and painting negative spaces. So, what does that mean? And she shows uh, me a picture. And what she's done, and I think this is amazing, is she's drawn a chair. Which isn't the impressive part. She's drawn a chair by drawing everything except the chair. And so what there is, is on this page, there's all this shade and lot darkness and, and stuff. And in the blanks, there is a chair. I thought, wow! That's an incredible thing to be able to do. Drawing in negative space. <clears throat> now, when it comes to preaching and theology, I mostly focus on the chair. I mostly focus on the things of God. Grace, love, hope, <coughs> compassion. Because that's mostly what I'm interested in. Uh, but sometimes, sometimes we need to also be aware, at least, of the negative space. And uh, in, the, in, the, in today's Gospel, we have the story, the recounting of the beheading of John the Baptist. And there's, uh, there's three people here who I think are very good examples of what happens when the negative space, in a sense, becomes dominant. When the sin becomes dominant. There's Herod, uh, Herodias, and Herodias' daughter. And I'm going to start with Herodias' daughter. After the Holocaust which was a, a, a terrible thing. One of the things that did change, however, is the instructions given to the German army. Because one of the things that happened during the time of the Holocaust is that essentially they were given orders and they had no choice but to follow. And those orders, amongst other things, led to many, many, many horrific deaths. And now, the German army has as a standing order, you shall not do anything that sort of contradicts human rights and dignity. So that is, their, that is one of their prime orders. Herodias' daughter is an example of, in a sense, those German soldiers before. She does this dance for, for, uh, for Herod and and his friends at, and um, Herod says to her, you know, I'll give you whatever you want. And so what she does is she goes to her mum. And she is led astray because she's following the wrong person. She's not thinking for herself. She's not, you know. And so we need to be aware of who it is we follow. There's the song, you've got to follow someone in life. It's a Bob Dylan song. <coughs> so we have to be careful. 
Otherwise, we end up in the negative space. There's Herod. Now, Herod is actually really, really powerful. He's got, well, he's got the power to send someone to go and behead John. He's actually got the power to ignore Herodias' dislike for John. You know, she doesn't like him. She wants him dead. And he goes, oh, no, I'll throw him in prison. I like him. He's a funny little man, isn't he? He ignores him when it suits him. John says, you're not allowed to marry Herodias. He goes, oh, isn't that cute? And then ignores him. He's very powerful. He is comfortably powerful enough to do all these things. And what should happen is when, she, when Herodias' daughter comes back, he should say to her, no. I know I said I'd give you anything, but I thought you were going to ask for something sensible. Or something cute. This is stupid. No. That's what he should have said. That's what a good parent would have said. Yeah, you can have whatever you want for dinner. Can I have three blocks of chocolate? No. <laughs> but instead, because he's frightened of his guests' view of him, because he's afraid that they're going to see him as somehow less, I don't know, manly or something, he says, sure. He does what he knows is wrong, basically because of peer pressure. This is, this is the same issue we try and teach 8, 9, and 10 year olds to deal with at school. And he's a grown up. And because he bows to peer pressure, because he, he bows to his pride, because he lets these things guide and control him. He has John baptized. Herodias is another is another person. Uh, she has John the Baptist killed out of spite, out of bitterness because somebody doesn't <coughs> like her. Spite and bitterness. Now, usually those are things that we carry inside ourselves, and they don't really hurt the other person. Yeah. I can be bitter and angry as much as I like, and if, and if it doesn't actually impact you, if it only impacts me, it's my problem. But here she actually manages to use her power to turn that to back at somebody else's problem, quite literally. She, she, she gets him killed out of spite. So the thing for us then, is to take these negative space stories and to say, well, a couple of things. One, where is that in us? Now, as I said, in terms of uh, Herodias' daughter, we all follow people all the time. It's how human beings operate. It is innate in human society. It's how small children learn to walk and talk and, and, and like food and listen to music. It's how fish fashion operates. It's how good parenting operates. I'm going to show you what it's like, little version of me, to be a sensible human being. And hope that one day you'll grow up to be... That's how good parenting operates. We rely on the fact that we imitate each other. We imitate. However, as adults, we need to be aware of who it is that we're looking to. Who it is that we're imitating. As Christians, we're called to imitate Christ. Christians, followers of Christ. Herod. We all have pride and arrogance in us. We all have I'm right and you're wrong in us. We all have my way is the best way. But if we, don't, if we let that control us, if we let that control us, <coughs> then where do we end up? What's the end result of that? Being manipulated into doing things that we know we shouldn't do just so that we don't get shown up as being somehow less uh, important than we pretend to be. We all have memories. We all have memories of the times people have hurt us. We all have stories of times when people have 
perhaps deliberately, perhaps accidentally uh, hurt us. And we have a choice. We have a choice to let that be the dominant story in our lives of the time we were hurt. Or we can allow God's grace to enter in and allow the story to be of our journey to healing. Now that doesn't mean that the hurt didn't happen. It means we choose the dominant story of God's grace and healing. So let's take this negative, this negative space as a warning story so that we might learn to grow in God. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.